So thank you for joining us. Um, basically, today we're going to go through testing new ideas without destroying your brand. And this topic for this webinar came up based off of uh, quite a few conversations that I had with people over the years. Um, you know, I work with a lot of startups up here in Silicon Valley who they kind of care about their brand, but then they kind of don't. I mean, <laughs> if they're small, yeah, they don't want to do something completely outrageous, but they also, um, they're not protecting a hundred year old brand, which is, you know, quite frankly, the case when I'm working with some of these companies that have been established for over, you know, over a hundred years. So the idea of, wow, I want to test, but you know what? Our brand is, is like this prestigious thing that we want to protect and kind of, you know, <laughs> um, we want to, we want to use it to, for, you know, kind of for good. And so a lot of, I feel like the cultural pushback when I go into these organizations is, well, we can't possibly do that because of our brand. And it's almost like, have you ever been in these conversations where it's like a conversation stopper? Those, those are really hard for me, you know, cause I'm brought in as an advisor and as a coach and, you know, obviously people have challenges and they bring me in because they want to make progress. But then if you get this conversation stopper, right, where it's like, oh no, all those things are off limits. We can't even, con we can't even consider experimenting on that. It's just really tough. You know, it's, it's tough on both sides. It's tough for you working there in a company and feeling that way. And it's tough for me to come in and actually, you know, give you good advice and, and help you get unstuck. So um, sort of the, the genesis of this, this session was around that, you know, like what, who are, who is out there doing this right now? Um, how can we, you know, how can we kind of all learn together? Right. Um, and sometimes we can, because the stuff's out there on, you know, live on the internet right? <laughs> and we can just talk through it together. Um, so what I wanted to do today was basically go through a little bit of kind of logistics before we jump right in, you know, to, to the example. So basically um, this is being recorded. So what I'm going to do is I am going to host this after the webinar is over. And so if you have to bail early or if you signed up and, or your friend signed up and they can't join, right, um, this will be recorded. And I'm going to do as much as I can to answer your questions uh, while we're on here. But I also had hundreds of questions. Um, just people registering that I had to go through before the webinar too, that we're actually going to cover as well. So um, we are, we are going to uh, have lots of questions and lots of Q and a, but um, so as you basically go through uh, and listen to what I have to say today and see what I have, just please just, just drop the questions in as we go. Um, but I also have hundreds of questions. We're going to get, <laughs> we're going to um, go through some of the answers to those too as well. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, all right. So let's get, let's get started. So, um, just, just by smashing the, the hand button there, like how many of you want to test your products and features without destroying your brand, right? I, I imagine, <laughs> oh my gosh, you're going to break my software. So yeah, I can't see my screen anymore because my whole screen filled up with uh, notifications. So yeah, basically that's why you're all here is because we're all worried about this. And at the same time, you can't internally, right, iterate forever and keep refining and refining and refining and then release and just hope you got it right. And I, I find that um, it's almost like we learn more from our uh, failures and our successes, but inside corporations, right? The successes are the ones that are, that are really kind of uh, socialized, right? So if you did that for what, like what, even one time inside your organization and you got it right and you made millions of dollars for your company, you, it's like a golden ticket, right? It, you, you are kind of held up like you're amazing, Hey, everyone should work like that guy or that girl over there. And unfortunately, um, you know, some of that was probably luck <laughs> because, you know, yeah, you can refine internally forever and launch and get it right. But it, there's a lot of situations where you do that and you get it wrong. And when you get it wrong, it's almost like you can't recover from that, right? Because it's too expensive. And then you have this really high fidelity polished thing that you need to just pivot like, crazy to find a market where it even slightly resonates so you can break even or just save face, right? And so that's a very frustrating situation to be in. And it's also a situation to be in where you're probably not going to make great decisions, right? If you have all that pressure where you internally iterated on something and made it like super high fidelity and polished and scalable and everything it needed to be for like a million customers and you can't get a hundred customers into that, it, it's very, very frustrating to be in. So, uh, part of what I do, obviously, is I can go in and help teams kind of experiment through and pay down their risk as they go. Because, you know, while I've worked at companies in the past that, that did that, 
uh, we, we didn't actually uh, do very well. <laughs> and the first startup I joined, we were convinced we were business to consumer. And it wasn't until we pivoted to business to business that we took off and then we were acquired for 16 million. But that whole process, right, of just customer-free zone is, is very, very dangerous. So what I want to share with you today are kind of three examples. And again, two of them are, are live in the sense of I'm going to click and it's going to go to the website. And as I checked <laughs> 10 minutes ago, the websites are still there. Um, but you never know with these experiments because sometimes they just go away and it's not always obvious that, that, <laughs> that they're gone. Uh, so as of five, 10 minutes ago, they were there. Um, and then one where I had to kind of pull it together because uh, it's a timed experiment and, and, and um, basically it's hard to get that, that one live. So we'll go through that one as well. But these are examples that are kind of out there already today. All right. So first, I'm going to talk about crowdfunding. So um, for those of you who don't know what crowdfunding is, it's essentially going in and, and externally funding, you know, your initiative to get people to basically um, invest in it. Right. And when you talk about strength of evidence, uh, strength of evidence is something where uh, it, it's it, I feel like we make really poor decisions sometimes on uh, strength of evidence. So for example, we'll do something like interview customers, which I love, by the way, I love that we're interviewing customers because that is something that you need to do. But what they say is sort of, you know, it's not exactly what they do. And so I'm always looking for ways for us to kind of iterate from talking to customers and getting that amazing qualitative feedback and iterating our way to, okay, well, what will they do, right? What will they do? And so when you, when you think about that, you know, think about some of the projects you've done in the past and people are saying, okay, you got to talk to customers, right? And I, I feel like some of these teams, they, they talk to customers and it's amazing, but then they jump to building the whole thing out. And, you know, you extrapolate from maybe interviewing 15. Like I talked to a team in New York, they interviewed five customers before investing in an app. And I was like, five customers? Like, uh, who are those five customers? Because I hope they have a lot of money. Because basically, you know, jumping from really, really small anecdotal qualitative stuff, which, by the way, is useful, but it's not necessarily a slam dunk home run for getting to, to an app. So here in crowdfunding, I feel like it's a really interesting way to, to basically go in and say, okay, will people do something, right? Will they put their money behind? And, and this is a really interesting example. So over on Indiegogo, and this one's already been funded. Um, I'm just going to kind of click over to it. It's still up, right? Um, you'll notice it's closed. So you'll notice the branding here is really interesting. So this is still live. If you go to Indiegogo and you just search for this Opal Nugget Ice Maker, you can do it while you're here on the webinar with me. Uh, it's still up. And uh, you'll notice the brand's first build. And you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. It's kind of like a startup-y brand, right? Um, but what you do, like once you start kind of looking through it and you start seeing all of the different updates and the FAQs and the comments and everything, you start understanding like this is basically GE appliances. Okay. So, so this is essentially GE, a wholly owned subsidiary of GE appliances. And if you think of GE, right, like everyone knows kind of GE appliances, they're very, um, they're very big kind of go big or go home sort of, sort of way. You know, you have these large refrigerators, you have all of these, um, basically uh, washing machines, you yeah, yeah, have very large appliances, right? And this thing kind of like, it just sits on your shelf, right? And I didn't understand the whole fascination with this nugget ice. Apparently uh, people love this stuff. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize, uh, you know, quite, quite the demand for it. And then I don't know if I still have, yeah, I don't think I have it up. But basically, um, if you uh, go to their site, you'll, you'll start to see how, you know, wow, they, they actually have a whole product site dedicated to this now and essentially it comes from you know and, and again this was a while ago this was in 2015 but basically um they're able to manufacture these now and, and ship them but they're doing it kind of like with the backing of a corporate brand so you have that you know oh okay this isn't just a startup like they're actually backed by a corporation which in this case they're actually a wholly owned subsidiary um and if you go to their site and start looking through kind of their first build you know um like let's just do it right so let's just click on first build and you say, oh, this is pretty cool. They're like a micro factory. And then you go to products and you go, okay, well, what's Opal all about? Oh, here's their, here's their nugget ice maker after they got it funded, right? And when you look at it, you could start kind of reverse engineering your way without having any insider knowledge to say, like, how did they get to this, right? And, and even in the description, this is super interesting to me. Um, like people have Googled, right? Nugget ice maker for home. 
only to find with a price point of two thousand to three thousand dollars. And if you think about that, that's like that's a lot of money to pay for just something that makes ice. <laughs> um, but you could start kind of like playing that narrative back a little bit and say, you know what, they probably just went to Google key trend. Like they went to Google trends and started doing keyword analysis on like, what's the search volume on this? Or they, maybe they went to AdWords, right? And when you do key planner and AdWords, it's like, okay, show me, show me what people are paying for this. Show me what's the volume on it, right? And if people are literally actively searching for this phrase, nugget ice maker for home, right? Or nugget ice maker for home, then, then you start to get some evidence that, okay, Hey, people are actively, it's not just people saying they want this. They're actually going online and searching for it. There is a demand. And if you look at the competition and the price point is this, right? And you can make it for less. It's kind of a no brainer. And so I love, love what they did. You know, they said, look, we think this is such a great idea. Like we're going to literally crowdfund this thing. We're going to crowdfund it and we'll find out whether people want it or not. It's pretty obvious people wanted it <laughs> if you look at how much they raised <laughs> from almost 6,000 backers, okay? And so this is super fascinating to me, right? It's something out there online right now. You can just go and look at it. And it's a great example of people going, you know what? I can just imagine them kind of sitting in a conference room, you know? And, and not that you've ever done this, but maybe your friends do this where you sit in the conference room and you go, I think this would be cool if we did this. And someone else is like, nobody wants that. And you just go around and around forever. <laughs> like, it never ends. And there's no evidence ever inserted into that conversation. And uh, there's this really great saying, uh, I think it was, it was Collins who said, you know, like, basically, you know, if all we have opinions, right, and we're gonna go with mine, <laughs> and mine as in like my opinion. <laughs> and usually inside of an organization, hierarchically, like that is whoever is kind of above you, you just, they're just gonna go with their opinion, unless you can insert uh, evidence and data into right into the conversation. So this is fascinating to me that they actually went out and externally crowdfunded this thing to say, you know what, here's our external evidence. This is this is how many people want this, right? And if you go back to the site, right, you can see like this is the only product they have. They have other ones. I don't even know all the products they have, right? Like I don't I don't know a lot about this company, but it's super cool what they're doing. Um, but basically, you know, that is a way now. Years ago, this probably wasn't even an option. You know, I mean, you can look at 2015, but I'm looking back, say, like, say, 2010, 2005, uh, especially before crowdfunding became super popular. You'd probably say, you know what, this is an option. There's no way we could go externally fund this. But now there are actually examples. And this is just one. If you search Indiegogo, especially Indiegogo, um, I don't know what Kickstarter's stance is on this, but it seems like Indiegogo is like, hey, if you're a corporation and you're trying to do this, we'll help you. And, and, but Kickstarter, I don't think it's really interesting because Kickstarter and Indiegogo to me seem like very similar in their mechanics, but the cultures seem very different. It's kind of like, uh, like Uber and Lyft, right? <laughs> so like, yeah, they'll both take you places, but the cultures of these companies are super different. You know, even in the beginning, Uber's merged like kind of like buttoned up, almost like mercenary, like get in the back of the car, right? And Lyft in San Francisco was like, sit up front with me and sing karaoke and we'll have a good time. Like, Technically, yeah, they're going to get you where you need to be, <laughs> but they're very, very different companies as far as culture. And so that's the vibe, I, I vibe externally anyway, looking at Indiegogo and Kickstarter, like very, very different kind of vibes as culture. But anyway, um, but if you come back here, you could start saying, okay, well, how would we like start to do this at our company? And what are some of the things we would do and measure, right? So let's say, you know, because I believe you shouldn't just throw that Kickstarter out there or that Indiegogo out there and that crowdfunding program out there and say, okay, um, I'm just going to see what happens, right? You should probably have a hypothesis, right? And then you also have measurements as well, right? So number of unique views, right? Comments, shares, pledges, total pledge amount. Like what are the things that you could measure to see if you are on the right track or not? Okay. So what I would recommend as far as process, and I got a lot of process questions coming into this webinar, is you need to have kind of like a hypothesis about what you want to learn, right? And then you need to measure. And not all of these are the same strength of evidence either, right? So number of unique views of your, your you know, crowdfunding campaign. Okay, that's interesting, but you know, comments and shares. Okay, that's interesting, but what's your pledges and total pledge amount? And then you could even do things like if you're running ads, so that's another experiment you could do. You could run Google ads or Facebook ads or Instagram ads. When you're running those ads, you can also track them, you know, if you can wire it up properly to see like, what are the conversions for each one of these ads? Okay. So maybe people like coming off Facebook to our, our program or our campaign, they convert really well, but maybe people coming off Twitter convert poorly, poorly. 
right? Um, and so being able to trace that thread from your ad to your campaign can also be really, really helpful to you as far as, you know, okay, what are we basically going to measure to see other than, you know, getting funded or not, whether we're on the right track. And sometimes, you know, you might have to relaunch these things, you know? Um, and it's interesting, they take different forms too. If you go to like other Indiegogo uh, campaigns, you'll notice that some of them are kind of coming around in a different, different way. So anyway, crowdfunding is one. Here's another one I love, by the way. Uh, we'll get the resolution here. So, so basically, um, landing pages, I think time and time again, people talk about landing pages as something that, you know, is, um, you know, it's like, oh, well, we should just do a landing page. Well, you should always have a hypothesis behind your landing page. <laughs> and, um, but it's becoming more and more apparent to me that within a corporation, you do have options of doing landing pages without killing, with killing your brand. And so these are two, and, and basically um, this one is still live as well, so let's just double click into it. All right, so get Ginger, right? Now, if you look at this, it's like, okay, this pretty makes sense, right? Ginger project, okay, show your story. So we have our, our, our value prop headline up here, which is really interesting. So, so basically show your story to the world in minutes. And then you're like, well, what does that really mean? And then you look under it and you go, okay, so, oh, it's an explainer video, all right. So, and then there's a call to action, it's like, get it for your iPad. And you're like, wait, what, it's for already out for iPad. And then when you scroll down, you start understanding, oh, okay, this thing is Adobe, all right? So this thing started off as a project, you know, but now their call to action here is, oh, you just go get it, you know, and you click that and you go to the, to the iTunes store. Um, and you scroll down, and you start seeing, okay, well, this makes sense, you know, it's like, here's what it does, here's how it helps you. There's some examples. I'm not going to play these videos, but if you just go to the website, you can literally type it in here while you're on, on the webinar, and you can you can go to it and watch those if you want. But it's like, okay, this is pretty interesting. So Adobe had an idea for an explainer app, okay, and but they launched it as kind of like an off or a lightly branded project. Now, what's really interesting is because this was online, you could start saying, okay, well, let's just go to the Wayback Machine and see what did this look like before. So we're talking you know, September 2009, let's go back to 2013. It's like, oh, wait, they started this way back then. Like this is when they started testing this. And if you start looking, you'll see, oh, okay, this is a different call to action, right? So the Ginger project, okay, it's called Ginger, it's still same value prop, still same kind of uh, sub explainer underneath the value prop. But if you look here, you could see, oh, it's add your email to get notified. So this is really interesting. So if I zoom out a little bit here, you could start to see over time, and you could start reverse engineering this and say, okay, without knowing anything about how that team worked, you could start seeing, well, you know what? I think early on, they just had an idea and they put an email box in here. And when people signed up, they probably reached out and interviewed them and probably tested their product idea with them. Right, and they probably like made these things by hand and tested them with customers. And now, over time, right, it evolved into wow, this is like an actual app that's on brand that you can go download now. And so, again, really, really, really interesting to me. So here, I love that you know, because when you do off-brand testing, you could probably just kill the old site, right? Because even if you bring this thing on brand, it's like, well, don't need the other brand anymore. We'll just kill it. But here, right, it's like, you know what, we're just going to leave this up. And I, I really doubt this is meaningful acquisition anymore, right, because you have the whole like, marketing engine of, of Adobe behind it. But this is pretty interesting call to action. So you can kind of start reverse engineering your way back and say, okay, well, I start to see how, you know, if I'm really worried about my brand, right, and Adobe is a pretty stylish brand as well, I can lightly brand something as a project or a labs, right, and I could launch that thing. And then, you know, if it works great, we can bring it on brand later. Uh, and then, you know, see how they did this, right? It's now available as a, I, I mean, I doubt people were really crushed, right? When that happened, it's probably like, oh, okay, great. That's awesome. It's, it's, it's a great app, you know? Um, or if it doesn't work, like imagine if the thing was a complete flop and nobody wanted it and, you know, nobody signed up and even gave up their email. Then I can imagine them saying, well, you know what? Let's just sunset this thing. It's probably not a great, great idea. But, you don't sunset it with your brand front and center, right? It's sunset on this project brand or a labs brand. And so another really interesting example. And so again, if you do something like this, 
you probably want to have a hypothesis, right? And so you want to set, okay, if we do this, then we want 15%, you know? And I know 15% sounds, oh, that's pretty low. That's actually really, really hard to hit. I mean, I set the bar kind of high if we were doing something like this with a team because, you know, if you narrowly target your audience, which you should, right? When you do a landing page like this, you should not blast it out to everybody and just hope people sign up, right? You should have a customer in mind, you know, a persona or a value prop canvas or whatever you use at your company, Empathy Map, of who that customer is. And you should be able to narrowly either walk up to them, right, and literally interact with them that way or run ads to them and target them online or email. But basically, you want to tailor your message to them and bring them over, okay? And so this should be pretty high, this 15%, right? Because you want to know, hey, we feel really strongly in this, that this solves a real problem. And if we go to that customer and, and we drive them there, right? So literally, if you're searching in Google, let's say, for how to make an explainer video, and then you see, oh, wow, this is going to cost me like five grand for a freelancer to do it. I don't have that kind of money. And then you see, a, uh, you know, uh, wait, just use this, this app. It's like, you just do it in minutes without any really design skill. I mean, I imagine people coming over to that, if they land and they're like, yeah, this is what I want, they are going to convert. And convert early on means, you know, sending, uh, signing up with their email so they get beta access to it. Convert later on means I'm going to the iTunes store and I'm, I'm downloading that thing and I'm using it, right? And then it becomes part of your life cycle where it's, okay, well, do they actively use it? Did they come back and use it, right? Did they share it to their friends, right? And there's all these like traditional product metrics that you can measure there. But basically, you know, I think what you'll find if you're working with teams, you're trying this in organizations, is that if you try to hit that 15% right away, uh, you may not, right? And it doesn't mean you give up, like who knows how many iterations they had of those pages above, right? But I imagine, you know, you're going to need to keep iterating on the copy of the ad and you're going to need to iterate on the copy of the page. And if you get these things disjointed where they don't actually communicate to each other, then you're going to have these situations where people are going to like pound that ad and they're like, yeah, I want that. And they come over to your page and go, wait, this isn't what I expected. And they're going to bail. And so I've seen that happen a lot with, uh, with teams I work with where they're just not quite dialed in on both sides. And so it doesn't mean just try things and see what happens, right? You're never going to hit 15% that way. But you also need to keep thinking through, okay, well, the value prop on that ad has to match that H1 tag, that big, bold lettering at the top of my landing page, okay? Because if you don't have those in sync, you're almost always going to see people churn out when they hit that landing page because they're gonna, you're going to have like a super high click-through rate on your ad, and you're going to have a 0% conversion on your landing page. And as long as you in integrated analytics, you should not have a 0%. So um, that's something to think about. So basically, 15% is pretty good. You know, if you can say, wow, we targeted somebody and 15%, like 15 out of 100 were willing to give up their email for this, then that gives you the kind of confidence to say, I think we can move forward, right? So your measurements here, just specifically on the page, could be something like unique views and email signups, right? Um, you can also do all kinds of crazy stuff with landing pages anymore, and you don't really have to code to do it. Um, you could easily kind of plug in chat in here, right? And you could use something like Intercom or um, Lucky Orange or Crazy Egg. or You can find all kinds of ways to kind of interact with your customers, and you can also find a ways to see kind of what they're clicking on, right? So if everyone's clicking on these circles because they think they're links and they're not, you know, that's not going to show up in, you know, your traditional analytics packages, but you can integrate stuff to see kind of heat maps and stuff like that too. So again, I say landing pages are pretty much, if I think desirable, viable, feasible, right? You kind of start off like over here in this desirable realm. So say, is the value prop resonating? Does it actually make sense? Are we using the words of the customer here at the top? Do they understand what it does? And will it, we'll even give up their email. And email is like a sense of currency, but anymore, it's a pretty weak sense of currency <laughs> because uh, everyone has an email and everyone gets spam and they're like, yeah, I'll put in my email for that. I mean, it's, it's better than them abandoning, don't get me wrong, but it's not a like, oh, all right, we should go build the app now either, right? So uh, email's great, but then you probably want to reach out to those people and interview them and start to understand, okay, well, why did you sign up for that? <laughs> like, I think I know why you signed up. So I know the quantitative, the what, like the what is the sign up. But qualitatively, I have no idea the why. You just, you just hope that they loved what they saw and they want to try it, you know? And so this is another way where I think going like a project brand or a labs brand helps because 
imagine you launching this thing with your brand, like your, your 50 or 100 year old brand front and center. You're gonna have just a flood of people rush to sign up. And then it's a lot of noise because you really don't know if they signed up because they care. <laughs> like it actually solves a real problem. Or they signed up because it's your brand, right? It's kind of like going to a Peter Jackson movie, right? And you're like, I love Lord of the Rings. I'm gonna go see The Hobbit. And it's like, okay, but The Hobbit was kind of a terrible movie. <laughs> <laughs> but people would rush because it was his brand, right? Sorry for anybody that watched The Hobbit and loved it. It's pretty, pretty bad. Anyway, so the idea is like on brand, right? Basically, the idea of can you, uh, <laughs> like, can you have the idea stand on its own two feet, right? Solving a real problem that matters. And your brand front and center in that conversation may muddy the waters quite a bit. It, it may cause a lot of noise. It may cause a lot of work on your end because then let's say, let's say you launched this and you had uh, 10,000 people hit it on the first day and drop in their email. That's like 10,000 emails you're going to have to go through <laughs> and you're not going to interview 10,000 people, right? And so even surveying 10,000 people is kind of not the greatest approach right away. So it's like, wow, did anybody, these, like, how do we find out these people even cared? Um, it, it's, it's really, really fascinating. So just be mindful of, you know, it's not just, um, you know, trying to protect your brand, but it's also trying to see if, does this thing actually stand on its own? Like, take our brand away, does this actually solve a problem? And will people sign up based on its ability to, to solve its problem? Okay, all right, cool. All right, um, let's go to feature stub. And this one, we'll, we'll let it kind of come in here as well. But basically, um, this was the one, so I said there was one, right? In the beginning of the webinar, I said, you write, we got two live examples that I can literally click and we'll, we'll, we'll pull up the tabs and we'll look at it in live. This is the one that's super hard to do because basically a feature stub, and the way I've always used feature stubs and recommended people use feature stubs, is a feature stub is this kind of test that you do in your already existing app or, or product or service, right? It's something you put in there and you say, you know what, I'm, sit of, I'm really sick of sitting in this meeting saying we should add something and have people say it's a terrible idea. I'm basically going to add it in there and then say, you know, it's not ready yet and have analytics baked in. Okay. So if you look at Google, like Google does this to us all the time, right? <laughs> and Google kind of set the trend, but there are other companies like Facebook does it. Like there's so many companies at this point, it feels like it's just a part of the internet experience for better or worse, where I'm going to click on something and it may not be fully baked yet, <laughs> but you know, if I didn't click on it, they might not build it at all. And I really think this is an amazing thing, so I want them to build it. So there's kind of, you know, pros and cons there. But basically here, what I mocked up for you here is, so I have this experiment stack. This is in Google Sheets. Um, if y'all want this, I could actually just give you the link to this as well. But I kind of started putting together a list of things like, hey, what would I do for acquisition? What would I do for landing page? What would I use for A-B testing? And I just kind of started creating a list. But if you go on that list and you say tools, notification rules, right? And this doesn't work now, so if you go, I imagine if you pulled this up now and you went to notification rules, this probably wouldn't happen to you. So that's what makes this really hard to find in the wild. Um, it's like, oh, you discovered a feature that we haven't completed yet. And thanks for being patient, you know, learn more. So if you're Google, just kind of think this through. One, so if you get routed into a test like this using Google, it's like, all right, what are they doing here? Well, they think I'm the target customer, hopefully. Um, they're not like sending this test out to everybody. So I imagine they've segmented somehow who gets this even as an option, right? Who even sees notification rules? Okay, so that's one. Two, it's like, okay, so I clicked in here. Okay, did I, I saw a notification rule. So I, I see it here in my, in my tools, in the dropdown. Did I click on it? All right, well, that's another one. So you can even can track conversions from, did they see it to did they click, okay? Now that's really interesting data because if they saw it and didn't click, it could be, well, they didn't want it at all, right? It wasn't interesting. It could be that it was in the wrong spot, right? So sometimes we talk, uh, when I talk to designers, right, they're very much, you know, all, it's like, where, where in the experience do we kind of show people how to use this thing? And that's a really important question to answer. And sometimes, you, you know, you have a good idea for a feature, but you end up putting it in the wrong spot, right? And before investing in it, you know, big team and months of work and, and making it scalable and everything, and then realize nobody uses it, you're right, do some testing on is it in the right spot. Okay, let's say we clicked on this. Okay, we get this pop-up and it's like, okay, well, I got the pop-up. You discovered a feature and we haven't completed yet. Interesting. I could click okay, which is pretty interesting. 
which is going to basically do nothing. <laughs> it's just okay. I can just close out the window, right? Which they also track, or I can click learn more. And here, um, like if we had this wired up, basically learn more could do a series of things. Learn more could go to another page, right? That tells, it explains the product in, or the feature in more detail. You could essentially basically say something like, uh, let's do a survey, right? So if they click on that, you could have a pop-up survey and you could ask them really lightly, you know, you know, or how excited are you or how will you use this? You know, you can do all kinds of, uh, I wouldn't recommend doing like a 30 question survey off of a feature stub, right? But you could do something very simple, right? That would help people like, okay, yeah, I clicked on this. Yeah, I want this. You know, I, I, I wanted it enough to click learn more. And then I wanted enough to fill out a survey, okay? So this kind of stuff, it's pretty interesting to me because when you, well, one, it's hard to get routed in these in the wild because there, there's some rules around doing this. One is um, you never do this on some kind of mission critical thing in your app or your product. Like that would be the worst experience possible where it's this, oh no, this like big flashing red thing I need to click now to get a job or you know this task done. And it's like, oh, sorry, I haven't completed that yet. But you don't want to do it that way. That's a good way to, to burn through your customers, okay? but if you have some ideas of features that aren't critical, okay, and you don't have to go super fast, you don't have to go like, I'm just gonna put a link in here and it's gonna generate 404 errors and I'm gonna count them fast, which by the way, companies do. Um, I don't see it as used as much anymore, but if you go back and you read, you know, uh, just early stuff about TripAdvisor and the travel industry, like they used to do that stuff a lot where, they would say, okay, you have an idea, go test it. Go test it as fast as possible by throwing in a link, throwing it out there, and then counting how many 404s it generates. Again, you have to be mindful of where your risk profile is to do that, because if you did something like that, and let's say, you're like, well, uh, people just think our site's broken, boss. <laughs> we just generated a bunch of 404 errors. You probably want to be careful, like mindful of your industry, uh, what link you're testing, where, how many people see it, right? But uh, there are some companies that work that way. Um, however, most companies I work with kind of feel that's a little too risky. So they do something like this where they'll say, you know what, notification rules, this seems like a great idea. We should basically put this in here. We should show it to people for like a day. And what we'll measure is how many people saw it, how many people clicked on it, and basically uh, who said okay, who clicked learn more, and who clicked the X, and if we had a survey, who actually filled out the survey, right? So. You can go down here and start saying, okay, well, things like, I need a hypothesis that we think at least 3% of people that see this and want to learn more will actually fill out a survey. And it doesn't mean it's a make or break, like we either build a feature or we don't um, situation, but it's going to give you some evidence to help get you out of that opinion circle where it's just, oh, it's just recursive. We can go back and back and back again about whether we should do this or not. Right? So you can measure things like unique views, clicks, surveys completed. So you are going to probably need some you know, analytics development help as far as, uh, or, or just find a, a product out there that'll do this. You know, there are products like Pendo and Optimizely and products like that. But basically, um, this is something that you can do really quickly and it gets you out of that loop of just opinions. And you can start saying, well, we have some evidence. Like instead of 3%, it was 50%, right? Um, but just don't do it on mission critical stuff because we're in a world with the internet right now where this kind of interaction is something we are accustomed to. And so this isn't gonna burn through your customers usually. You know, if it's something you're like, oh, okay, oh, they haven't completed that yet. Yeah, I want them to build it. I'll put in my info, maybe they'll reach out to me. I really want them to build this thing, right? But if you're doing it in a way where it's kind of bait and switch with something really mission critical and then you don't plan on building it at all, right? That, that's gonna burn through your customers, okay? So you do need, you need a, like a moral compass when you're working through this stuff. But basically, this experience where you feel like, oh, I can't even confuse one customer, one user, that, that isn't reality anymore. And uh, I just wanna thank you for joining and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.